this morning. We're back where we've been. We're there, we were here last week. We're in Corinthians 10. Now we'll do verses 15 through 20. The issue here is the fellowship in Corinth. There were some liberties being taken that were not right. And some were sharing in the pagan meals at the pagan temples. So 1 Corinthians 10, 15 to 20, the title of the sermon is Fellowship with God or Demons. No, I'm not trying just to be shocking here. That's actually in the text. And the material here not only is applied to the Corinthians and their desire and willingness to go fellowship at the temple of the pagans and their practices, which are really quite abhorrent. There's also commentary that Paul's providing from Deuteronomy chapter 32. So we'll see that that's where this comes from. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and kindness. Thank you that you allow us to look into these things which you revealed in your word. Thank you that we can learn and grow and be warned and be encouraged by what you've said and done and what others have gone through that we might put our faith in you and trust you alone. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So now we'll go to verse 15. 1 Corinthians 10, 15. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. The word sensible, I have the Greek here, uh, and it has to, has to do phronimos, has to do with thoughtful. Now, if you were here last week, I was talking in this, the sermon where we talked about fleeing from immorality, and we had an application that came from the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, and how he fled to get out of the situation with Potiphar's wife. And when I dealt with that, we're, we're looking at the f- way he got himself to get out of there. He used reason. My master has treated me well. He's put all these things under me. He's treated me right. You're his wife. I cannot do this thing. He used reason. And he, uh, I, I want to segue now to where we are today. I speak to you as wise or thinking people, or sensible people. The thing that alarms me the most with the present uh, evangelical culture is the emphasis on the mystical, the romantic. In fact, people write books portraying Jesus as the romantic Jesus in a spiritual sense. Dear ones, romantic idealism will not keep you out of the pagan temple. As a matter of fact, romantic idealism comes from paganism and from the East. And so what we have is reasonable facts revealed by God that from the scripture that we can take and understand with our minds and apply to real situations. Joseph did that And it led him to flee from immorality. Judge here, he asks them to judge for yourselves what I say. This is very important. Preachers aren't here to just tell you, do this and don't do that. I I have this big education, so you should just listen to me. No, that's not the way it should be done. We are to present the truth of the word of God, and every believer has direct access to God and to the scriptures, and you can reasonably judge what's being said. Paul the Apostle, pointed by Jesus Christ, asked the Corinthians, who had many problems, judge what I say. Take this. It's based on scripture from the Old Testament and his uh, teaching of Christ that he received from Christ that's given directly to them. And so this is an imperative in the Greek, judge. Make a judgment. I'm quoting a, a 
Bauer Dink or Arndt Gindrich here, to make a judgment based on taking various factors into account. Dear ones, your rational mind is a gift from God. Don't listen to anybody telling you to turn it off. Don't believe that any meditative technique that requires the silencing of the mind is going to do anything but harm you. The scriptures are full of facts, historical events, words from God that are objective and understandable, and that's our worship is through the truth. So we understand Paul's reasoning and wisely apply it. That's how it works. Now, um, the word for sensible is also used in Matthew 7, 24. I'll just allude to this. In Matthew 10, 16, the wise man, Eric preached on this recently, the wise man builds on the rock. Matthew 10, 16, the disciple who is shrewd in his, the shrewdest serpents, meaning understanding the dangers and taking action to avoid the danger. That is the same word, to be sensible, to know the truth. Now, I have a statement I put on my notes to make sure I don't forget to say this. Discernment is based on reason grounded in Scripture. It is not based on feelings, romantic idealism, metaphysical impressions, or religious traditions. Paul uses scripture based on God's past dealings with Israel and objective implications from it to teach and exhort the church at Corinth. What seemed desirable and beneficial to them turns out to be fellowship with demons. And the warning is pertinent to this very day. We're not being extremists by warning evangelical Christians that those who are pointing to Eastern religion and romanticism and feelings first are pointing into a way that will lead to deception. The word translated sensible can also be translated as prudent, prudent. So therefore, teaching objective biblical truth will help the church be wise and prudent and have a grounding in redemptive history, the facts revealed by God that will help us live in wise ways and therefore avoid the traps that are laid out there by the pagan culture. Um, let me just make one more statement. They're not talking about the Corinthians here. Their approach to the pagan temple deities and practices shows a serious lack of true wisdom. Yet Paul, using an imperative, says, judge for yourselves. Wisdom comes from objective truth revealed in Scripture. They go to the pagan temple. There were many, as I've shown you, in Corinth at the time. This is historically accurate. There were temple prostitutes. There were sacrifices offered to polytheistic deities. There were business opportunities. There was wealth. There was a sensual experience. There was everything they could want. And when they look at the gathering of the Christians, there's a few Christians gathered in an ordinary home breaking bread and thanking God. If we look at what looks impressive, we'll be seduced by things that are not from God. If we look at objective truth, we'll rejoice in things that seem very unimportant to the world we live in. Now let's go to verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless... Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Just as a background statement, I read four fairly technical commentaries based on the Greek to prepare for each of these sermons, and you wouldn't believe what happens when you get to this verse. 
church history has so sullied the doctrine of the Lord's uh, Supper that it creates just pages and pages of theological debate over presence is the the substantiation doctrines, the, the things that arose in church history that are really anachronistic. They didn't exist when Paul wrote. And so I had to read three or four times as much material on this one verse than I normally would. But most of these scholars, by the way, think, I'm thankful, put that stuff aside and go back to the real source of this, which was Israel in the wilderness, which is what we see in the context, and what Paul is teaching them right here. It's anachronistic to assume something that arose in church history hundreds of years later is how we learn to understand the text here. Church history, as we know it, didn't exist when Paul wrote. Did you know that? Some, a lot of people seemingly do not. So therefore, we're going to do that. We're going to look at the text and what was there that came from Christ and what commentary Paul's making from Moses. The blessing, eulogia and eulogeo, are the noun and verb form. And in, in Hebrew, I believe it's barakah. It has to do with blessing. Now, in the context, in the biblical uh, situation, throughout the Bible, you're not blessing a thing. You don't bless a car or a $10 bill or a threshold or even food. We say bless the food, but that's not biblical. The true blessing is a thanksgiving to God, and we utter a blessing. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who gives the fruit of the earth. Let me give you an example, probably one of the finest ones in the Old Testament. If you want to know where this is in your Bible, you can look it up. 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. I talked about this quite a bit when I taught through Ephesians, because Ephesians chapter 1 is a big, long blessing of God, to bless God, the giver, the one who does mighty deeds, the one who provides, the one who demonstrates who he is, the one who makes promises. And so we're uttering from our mouth the blessing of God as he is in what he said and done. Okay, I assume you found that even though I was talking away. 1 Chronicles 29.10. So David blessed the Lord as Yahweh in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. Verse 12, 1 Chronicles 29. Both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Verse 13, now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Amen, amen. And you've probably heard that somewhere. I'm, just, I'm sure it's been put to song. I think I've heard it in a song. That's how you bless you don't bless an object. Church history is full of traditions of getting religious prelates who, who are deemed to have some kind of magical power to bless a thing, a building, or even the elements, as they call it, of the Lord's Supper. It's not the bread that's blessed. It's God who provided it and allows us to partake as people who are the recipients of his good grace and his many gifts. So David's famous blessing in 1 Chronicles will help us get the idea. 
So God has declared blessed, not a cup. Participation is the word koinonia, fairly famous, often trans, trans, or, uh, transliterated into English, so a lot of people know it. And it's a word for fellowship. And it has a rich set of connotations from various scriptures having to do with what's in common. Koinos is common. Our common faith, our common fellowship, our common relationship with the Lord, our common relationship with one another. That's koinonia. Some have, have defined that as sharing of a common life together. So however simple it might be, However unimpressive, however ordinary, Christians sharing the Lord's Supper because they know him, they've been forgiven and dwelt by the Spirit. Even a few of them, two or three gathered together, if needs be, they are breaking bread and blessing the Lord and they have this common life, koinonia. So this is a reference to the Lord's Supper that we'll get to in more detail in chapter 11, where it talks about the words we call the words of institution. So let me make a couple statements here. I want to cite one scholar. I think it's probably the only time I'll do that today. Let's see. But koinonia in this context to know solidarity with Christ and one another in Christ. It implies a communal participation in the blood of Christ, which was shed once for all. And Paul's point that he's going toward and driving toward is this. You have this blessing, this common relationship that's been provided once for all by Christ. Why are you going to fellowship with the pagans, with their deities? that aren't really gods at all because they're finite and were created by humans and the practices that they have at their pagan temples are immoral and unrighteous and are not valid for Christians and so in a sense they're despising the Lord and his provisions. Dr. Gardner Paul Gardner's commentary 1 Corinthians is excellent for any person who's a theological student, student, want to know which one to buy. There's a lot of good ones. Paul Gardner's excellent. He says this, the cup of blessing is the cup over which a blessing or thanksgiving to God is prayed. The first plural, eulogumen, suggests the, the, excuse me, suggests that this may have been a prayer of thanksgiving in which the whole congregation joined. There's no sense here of the cup of wine itself being blessed, says Gardner. In Jewish and Christian thought alike, it is God who is blessed. The genitive of blessing, teishulogias, is thus objective. Objective genitive would be different than subjective one. It is not the cup that possesses a blessing that the people receive when they drink from it, but a cup for which a blessing, a thanksgiving is giving is given to God by the people who then drink from it. Blessed be you, O oh God, our salvation, our provider. Blessed be you, King of the earth, the Holy One, the righteous one. Dear ones, we're so prone to paganism, we think we can bless things, inanimate objects. Church history is filled with error. And I'm thinking after the death of the apostles, or maybe after the legitimate, I can't even say the word, after they made Rome legitimate 300 years later, all this stuff came in. It's pagan. Blessed person, blessed thing. Person can be blessed by God. But an office or a vestment or items, it's not blessed. It's not what the Bible's talking about. Let's go to verse 17. 
1 Corinthians 10, 17 from the ESV. Because there is one bread, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So you notice one, 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 three times. Here we are seeing the emphasis on the redeemed community. When we practice the Lord's Supper, we're reminding each other of that. It's very simple. It's not some high holy liturgy. It's people being grateful from the heart for what God did. It's that we are willing to hang around with us ordinary folk who the Lord has shown mercy to. The, the more liturgical, high church, this, that, and everything else, the further we get from Christ. Christ did not ordain some physical temple to be built and create layers and layers of authorities and layers and layers of traditions and make them binding on Christians so that they can't hardly find the gospel in a Christian church. We can read the text. If we read this text, it's as simple as what Paul is telling us it is. In fact, they made it a little more than that. In 1 Corinthians 11, they will be rebuked. The rich people wanted something more than a few people breaking bread together. So they had a big lavish house with an atrium, and the key people got to have their big meal, and the unimportant people sat out on the outskirts. That's in 1 Corinthians 11. So he rebukes it. It's the one bread, one body, we're to partake together. Many in the all described the unity we have in Christ, indwelt by the Spirit, and the plurality would be the individual persons God has saved. That's the work of God. How does that come about? It comes about when God saves somebody. As soon as you're born of God, by believing the gospel, you are part of this unity of the faith. And this unity persists, excuse me, and it's true, it's true between you and I and people we haven't met, that we won't meet till heaven. Or if you travel, you'll run into somebody who knows the Lord. And it won't take long to know that you have unity, because God made it, not man. It's not an ecumenical movement, it's a work of God. <clears throat> There's a stark contrast here with pagan meals where they made a sacrifice to their deity, hoping to please that deity, and they receive benefits. So the more they sacrificed to their deity, they thought they might get a benefit. Maybe my business will prosper. Maybe my household will do well. Maybe I'll have a lot of health. They're not sure, but they're sacrificing the deity. And I've heard people say that. Well, I need all the help I can get. So why don't I try that? Well, the fact is, we need more than all the help we can get. We need to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We need to have whole new lives that are given to us by a gift. So the pagans were trying to get the deity to do something for them. But biblical Christianity, grounded in Revelation, going all the way back to the Old Testament, is what God does for us. Uh, by grace as a gift, not hoping we do something right, the deity will throw a few crumbs to us. Uh, let me just cite Exodus 19, starting with verse 3. I'll just cite this, if you want to take note on your notes. Exodus 19, 3, I'll read through 6. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. You yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, 
and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Moses was given that directly from God, from Yahweh, about Sinai, as a great uh, reminder of what he'd done to bring them out of Egypt and who he was, their Redeemer, their God, and how they'd, he brought them to himself and their promise that they'd be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But sadly, while that was going on, they were down there making their golden calf. We can't see Moses. Where's Moses? Don't see him. Up there in the cloud. We'll make a golden calf. We can see that. And if we get sick of the golden calf, we'll melt him down and make something else. That's the irony. One more statement here. The simple, this is my statement. The simple truth that one bread, repeated for emphasis, reminds us, reminds us that we are one body. The body of Christ stands in solidarity with the Lord as they called out people, a kingdom of priests. Kingdom of priests. You don't need to go find some holy man to bless you. You've already been blessed if God put you into his body and called you kings and priests to himself. Verse 18, 1 Corinthians 10, 18. Now consider, and uh, that means there's a word for look, it's an imperative. Pay attention. Consider, Israel according to the flesh are not the ones, are not the ones who eat the sacrifice shares in the altar. Now this verse is considered the most difficult in this whole section. You'll notice that most of your English translations do not even include according to the flesh. It's in the Greek, but it's often not translated. I can't say why I use the LEB from the logo software, because it did translate it. Because there's some question about what that phrase would mean, according to the flesh. Does it mean Israel as it existed when Paul wrote? Does it mean the temple as it existed as Paul wrote? Does it mean just some of the Israelites and so on? So... Having done a lot of reading again, I came to the conclusion that the best answer is that Paul is still on the same topic. Through this whole chapter, he's talked about the wilderness Israelites, the ones that came out of Egypt, the ones that were provided water from the rock, the ones that were given manna for food, the ones who bitter water was turned sweet, all of those great things from God. Israel, according to the flesh, I believe, is the wilderness generation that mostly died in unbelief. We've talked about that before. So that's the best I can do with this. I think it's an allusion, possibly, to Deuteronomy 14, 23, where it says, You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name. Then in verse 26, Deuteronomy 14, And there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. So I believe that generally the, the reference is to God providing manna, water, food, and they ate in his presence. But yet the rebellion meant that most of them ended up going astray. So we'll come to this. Uh, again, I'm doing my best with a very difficult passage because no one is completely sure what according to the flesh means in this context. But I think we're still talking about Deuteronomy 32. Sharers, the word in the Greek, koinos, is a transition to the next two verses. And so he's going to pick up on the term sharers. If you want to take a look, let's... Let's turn to this. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 32, 9, and I'll, I'll read through 13. Deuteronomy 32, 9. Deuteronomy 32, if you're a Bible student and you really want to know an important passage in the Old Testament, you need to know Deuteronomy 32. That chapter is called the Song of Moses. 
And Deuteronomy 32 contains many important truths that have to do with our worldview as Christians. So I'll just read a little bit of this. Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 13. But the Lord, this is Yahweh's portion, is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. You've probably heard that phrase before. It means pupil. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its, pinion, on its pinions. God saw Israel, chose them as a special people, guarded them, provided for them, protected them, and this was a reason to bless God. Verse 12, the Lord, which is Yahweh alone, guided him. Notice, no foreign God was with him. That's going to be the point that Paul's making. No foreign God was with him. He made him to ride on the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. So this is part of the Song of Moses, what God did for his dear people to provide for them and protect them. Indeed, to actually make them his people. Eric's been talking in Sunday school about why is it that Israel is so hated to this very day? There's your reason right there. If God blesses anyone, it's a sure thing that they'll be hated by the world. So let's go to verses 19 and 20, the last two in this particular section. When we come back at the 28th, I'll pick this up because we're still going to be on the same topic. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 20. Now, let me put this in context. All the way back, there's been a dispute between Paul and some in Corinth about some of their slogans. And their slogans were leading them astray. We all have knowledge. That is one of them. We all have knowledge. Yeah, their knowledge was there's only one God, so therefore all these other things have no status and it doesn't matter what we do. We can go to the temple. Food is nothing. It's just food. So we can eat the sacrifices offered to idols. And other slogans, which they used to justify going to the temple prostitutes. But now we get, this doesn't come up, the demons don't come up till here. So Paul's laying this all out and arguing with them based on scripture as he comes along. And at this point, he gives them the real problem that's even greater. Not that the others weren't real. <laughs> Excuse me. And that is, there is a spiritual reality here. Let me read it. Therefore, what am I saying? That food sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. Right there, he's tacitly agreeing with some of the things they say. These idols don't have the ontological, which means being. They aren't actually deity. They didn't create the world out of nothing. They're not omnipotent. They're not omniscient. They're man created, but there may be a reality spiritually. Okay, no. But the things which they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be sharers with demons. And so here, sharers, koinonos, fellowship, is the capstone of his argument. Even if you could convince yourself that these things are okay because they're not any big reality to them, even that's a deception. There are fallen spirits, there are, there are evil spirits, and you may very well 
be fellowshipping with demons. And some might say, and I've had this said to me before because I write a lot of articles, you're just being uh, melodramatic, trying to scare everybody so they can't worship the way they want or they can't read the books they want. Or, well, I'm not telling people what books to read. I'm telling them what the books are saying and why some things are wrong. We have romantic Jesus out there. I wrote a critique of a book like that. We have Eastern meditation masquerading as Christian prayer. We have silencing the mind in order to hear the spirit world or experience the spirit world. We've interviewed people who got delivered out of that when they found out that these warm, fuzzy spirits were actually demons because the demons revealed their true nature, nature and attacked the worshipers. So no, I'm not just looking to be, you know, outrageous. I'm telling you cold, sober truth. And this is from the mouth of the apostle who got it from, also from Moses, the Old Testament. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. I do not want you to become sharers with demons. Here's the big lie, saints. I've heard it most of my life including before I became a Christian when I went to just sort of a watered-down church. The good Lord understands, and everybody's basically good, and it all kind of works out, and if you have warm feelings and you're kind of a good person, that's all that's required, and so on. And so if you get warm, enticing feelings from a spiritual source, it must be God. And so that's the, the statement. But Paul doesn't see it that way. He's not talking to them about what feelings they had when they went to the pagan temple. Judging by the size of those temples that excavators of archaeology have found in that area, they were very successful. I had a teacher at seminary who said, look at it this way to help you understand. Here's this great big huge flourishing temple with all the people coming and going, the smells and the sounds and the excitement. And here's a little bitty group of Christians in a little, in a little home. That's what's going on. And Paul's saying to them, it may look good, but there's danger. And then we'll get to that in chapter 11. What looks great, what feels great, what sounds great, may not be from God. There's real spiritual danger, and the Bible is not telling us to go by our feelings. It's telling us, both in the Joseph narrative and here, to be sensible people. I speak to you, Paul said, as sensible people. Judge what I say. Is this valid? Is this true? And now he's bringing it full circle here. These idols are not truly God. Yes, that's right. They are not. Wood, hay, stubble, stones, gold, diamonds. I don't care what they're made of. They're not God. But demons are real. Now, I point out here that the basis for this, I believe, is Deuteronomy 32, 17, since there's so much in Deuteronomy 32 that lays behind this passage in the section that we're studying. It says in Deuteronomy 32, 17, Song of Moses, they sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that have come recently, whom your fathers never dreaded. Believe me, when the Israelites came out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God, and they were delivered from their slavery. And the Egyptians died. And the army was drowned in the Red Sea as Israelites came through. God brought them out with a mighty hand. They knew who God was. Pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. The manna, the water 
from the rock, the mighty deeds. But yet, why after all that would anybody go for something else? Because sensuality, feelings, this stuff, what's this stuff? I'm sick of eating this stuff. I would like something better. So what did they get? Quail. Till they vomited it. But, um, you know, <laughs> this is too ordinary. We're breaking bread and having a cup and we're, we're, we're there with other Christians who aren't necessarily the movers and shakers in the world, or maybe some. But this is cold, sober truth. It's the, really the creator. It's the very creator of the whole universe who brought the Israelites out. And it's the creator of the whole, whole universe who came into our world, God the Son, and gave us a way out of darkness and sin. And his provision may look kind of basic, but it's worth everything because it came from the creator who loves us. It's the relational and the objective, not the seducing spirits. Sharers, koinonos. Uh, Dr. Gardner calls this covenant participation. And we don't want that to be with demons. I'll quote him one more time. Paul strong, strongly maintains biblical monotheism here, says Gardner. However, he acknowledges that as they worship idols, people are truly reflecting their allegiance to another Lord or Lords who do indeed exist in the form of demons. Neither the food itself is special, nor do the wooden or clay idols have any existence in themselves. It is the people worship and eat in direct disobedience to the one true God and covenant Lord. They give a terrible reality to the meal. They are worshiping demons. And you might say, well, that, that was a long time ago. Would anybody in the 21st century that goes to a Christian Bible college or seminary or to an evangelical church that engages in uh, mystical contemplation be worshiping demons? Could that even happen? Could it be possible? And what, what, why would you even suggest such a thing? Well, because Paul does, and it's real. And we have talked to people over the last 30 years who got into serious bondage using Eastern religion because it's designed to take you away from your rational mind and put you in touch with the unseen realm without going through the true God who's, who's the Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to... Just a couple of applications. I'm going to save a bunch of these for next time, which will be on the 28th, because it's the same topic. We're not going to switch topics. Number one, we must understand the far-reaching implications of fellowship with God and one another. Two, the spiritual darkness of the fallen world entices us to false fellowship, which is seductive, but not from God. Three, the true fellowship with God must be exclusive. The Lord alone is the Lord. And we come to him on his terms. You ever, people say this, and I thank God for the evangelism team that goes out and queries people about what they believe. And we heard a nice report about that Wednesday night. But um, a lot of people think, well, why is God so narrow-minded? What does he care? Why can't, why can't there be many ways to God? Because God is who he is, and he's told us how to come to him. Acts 2.42. I want, to look, want us to look at the very first gathering described in Acts after the day of Pentecost. The church is born on the day of Pentecost. As the gospel is preached, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Peter preached. For, about forgiveness of sins, as Jesus had instructed them. Acts 2.42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. So here were the very first converts who heard Peter preach, came to faith, 
And Peter's sermon, by the way, was full of scripture from the Old Testament. This is that which was promised. Your sons and daughters are prophesied. Your old men dream dreams and so on. This is that. And then he cited various scriptures. This is the very beginning of the church. And so those people that, some of them anyhow, first converts, came to faith. Let me just cite a little bit of that leading up to this verse. Acts two thirty seven to 41. Now when they heard this, Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's in verse 39. Pay attention to that. Who are the members of the church? Everyone the Lord calls to himself. Now, this cannot be the universal call because then everybody that ever hears it is a church member, even if they reject it. It has to be the effectual call, the inner call that you know This means me. I need the Lord. This is me. They said they were cut to the heart. I remember the first time I was cut to the heart. Before that, I was an angry blasphemer. Right up to the very moment of my conversion. Angry blasphemer. Cursing Christians. Using the Lord's name in vain. Making threats. Hostile. But in a moment of time, I knew it was all true. And that if I continued in this vein, there really was a hell, unlike the, the pastor told me there wasn't any in the, other, in the liberal church. I knew there was one, and I knew that I would go there and that I deserved to be there. And I didn't, I fled from that and called upon the Lord Jesus for salvation. And I was a different person. Whether it was dramatic or not doesn't matter, but that you're called to himself. And anyone called to himself or those that we're talking about, one bread, one, one fellowship, one Lord, where we become one with people we didn't ever think we would want anything to do with. Singing songs that we thought were silly. In a little church two blocks away from where I was saved. But I was glad to do it. Once the Lord got a hold of me. Though, and th- so those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So that was a significant amount. But looking at the whole world population, it's a remnant they started with. And it says, uh, notice it says, he continued to exhort them, save yourself from this crooked generation. Save yourself from this crooked generation. What's the crooked generation? Where did that come from? Well, that will will come up next slide. Mention crooked in Deuteronomy 32. But before that, let me finish preaching the gospel right here. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about who he is, what he did, why we need him, and what he calls us to do. Who is Jesus Christ? God, the Son, second person of the Trinity, creator of the whole universe, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, the fulfillment of many scriptures, did miracles that were attested to by those that saw and heard that no one had ever done to prove his deity. He predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection and accomplished it. He was crucified. He did die. He was in the tomb. He was raised on the third day. And he bodily ascended to heaven after appearing to many witnesses. What does he expect of us? Well, it's very simple. Repent and believe the gospel. Not live for the gods of this world or the darkness that's out there or whatever we think is right. 
but turn to Christ and live by his grace for him to receive the gift of eternal life, not by works, but it's a gift that's given to those who turn to him. You can know you have eternal life when you're converted. That's the gospel. Today, believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved. Turn from these vain things and serve the living God. I think I'll get through this next slide. Deuteronomy 32, 5 and Philippians 2, 15. By the way, this isn't a whole lifetime of trying to do better. It's a gift. It's the pagan deities that make people keep doing all these things. Jump through the hoop. Try this. Give more. Go to more services. Give more of your money. Do this. Do that. Serve the church. Do whatever you, we tell you to do. But God gives gifts. Isn't that something? Like the prophets of Baal, they kept cutting themselves and screaming and they couldn't get their deity to do anything for them. The pagan temples had plenty of things they asked people to do. Deuteronomy 32, 5. Remember 32, that's where uh, Paul gets a lot of the categories. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. The word crooked and twisted, those words are cited by Peter on Pentecost. The crooked generation. It would be the ones who had the shared experiences. They were there. They came out of Egypt. They saw the miracles. They ate the manna. They drank the water from the rock. They saw God's mighty deeds. And they became crooked when they went after other gods. Saying to the golden calf, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They knew that wasn't true. So that's what that means. Philippians 2.15 uses the same terminology that comes from Deuteronomy 32. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Dear ones, this simple little group that Paul's talking to, Christians, breaking bread together, sharing your common salvation, not looking too impressive, are the ones who are the lights in the world, ordinary folk. There's a few who are mighty in this world that the Lord converts, like we see in Acts. Lydia would be a good example. But they don't take that as a big deal. The real joy is to be part of the family of God. So here we have the song of Moses again, and Philippians mentions the same thing. How could you be blameless and innocent children of God in this sick world? It gets worse all the time. Because God, first of all, imputes the righteousness of Christ to our account, imputed righteousness of Christ. And secondly, he enables us to walk with him and cleanses us day by day and forgives sins. It keeps us in his hand. If you read that song of Moses, he carries us on eagle's wings to himself. And ultimately, that's our destination. Deuteronomy 32, 6 through 9. <clears throat> song of Moses. Do you thus repay the Lord? Verse 6. You foolish and senseless people. Is it not he, your father, who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old, verse 7. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. Verse 8. Now I'm quoting from the ESV. A lot of the translations are based on a reading that's pretty much agreed upon, not correct. But let me, let me read from the ESV here. And when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance... When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples, that's the nations, according to the number of the sons of God. The sons of God reading is the same one we see in Job 1, when the sons of God became, came before God, the divine council. This is a divine council. In God's divine council, 
It's determined the boundaries of the various nations. But there's a unique exception, and that's in verse 9. But, notice the contrast, the Lord's, this is Yahweh, Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. See it right there. That's why all the hatred of Israel. God bestowed special blessing to Israel. Thus, hatred of the Jews. Now, even to this day, Israel isn't right with God. Even back in the land, that will still happen. But people hate whoever God blesses. So that's an important passage. So therefore, when we as Christians, if we believe in the gospel, we're grafted in, as Eric has been teaching, and we become part of the root that's mentioned as a metaphor in Romans, and we also don't fit in to the dark world around us. Ephesians 5.11, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. One more verse and then we'll close. Colossians 1.13, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. How do you get into the kingdom? Do you raise up an army? No. Do you fight the world until you're in charge? No. You get into it through becoming a child of the king. Colossians 1.13, rescued from the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of his son. And we long for the return of Jesus, who is the true king. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for showing such kindness to us. Thank you, thank you Lord, for that we could be so privileged to look into these things that you've revealed in your word. And may we be thankful people who bless you, the giver of all. Thankful that you've put us into your family. And may we be mindful to share your gospel so that others can be rescued and wise enough to not get into the things which would entrap us. Thank you for everything you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen.